the Joe Rogan experience. When do you think the first news arrived that of this catastrophe? <laughs> July 4th. Mm. July 4th, 1876, the 100th, 100th anniversary of the approval of the Declaration of Independence, the, our, 100th, our, our 100th birthday. <laughs> News arrives of, of this crushing of Custer. You know. yeah. The nation, the military, was not going to let that stand. You know. So this was part of the reason that there was this, this extraordinary effort you know, to, des- to destroy these people. So they very quickly broke up into these constituent bands uh, and tried to get away as best they could. And less than a year, they were they were defeated. And you talk about what happened after that in your other book on the Nez Perce, mm-hmm. the, the last Indian War. Yeah, right. Yeah, that was the next year, uh, 1877. Uh, the Nez Perce were this extraordinary people in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they were from Idaho, uh, from eastern Oregon. They, too, composed of these different bands, uh, gathered together in this uh, this one common identity, uh, the Nimipu, which means the real people. <laughs> uh, and they were completely at peace with the whites. In fact, uh, Lewis and Clark had been the first, uh, uh, the first Americans, the first white people that they had ever seen, Lewis and Clark came over Lolo Pass, uh, down in there, they were starving, uh, and the, uh, the Nez Perce took them in, uh, saved them, uh, gave them, uh, helped them get some uh, uh, horses uh, and canoes to keep on their way, and on the way back, uh, Lewis and Clark stayed with them more than a month, and they formed, in the, in the eyes of the Nez Perce, they formed this alliance with the Americans. And they swore, uh, from this time on, we're friends, we're allies. Uh, you help us when we fight, we'll help you when you fight. And that was in 1806. Uh, 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 they kept that promise from 1806 uh, until 1877. Wow. As they were, their land was being overrun, uh, as these uh, uh, appalling treaties were being forced upon them, uh, they kept their word. Uh, and then finally, in 18, uh, 1877, the government said, okay, that's enough. You've got to come into this reservation. Uh, and the ones who were living off of it uh, had to then, within one month, within a month, they had to pack up everything. They had to <laughs> leave their homeland that they had known for generations. Uh, they had to cross the Snake River at its highest point, somehow get their families, you know, women, children, kids, old folks, um, across this river to, to gather, to go into this reservation, end of a way of life. Uh, even though the treaty that required them to do that was a was a was a was a, was a, a fr- fraud, uh, and on the eve, literally the day before they were to go on to the reservation, to be forced onto the reservation. These young men sort of snapped, and these young men took off and killed a bunch of white folks, you know, that they had grudges against. Um, that then triggered this war, uh, triggered this larger outbreak against whites. That then, of course, brought the army in, uh, and the army tried to uh, to, to put this down. Um, but as I researched that book, uh, the question that keep kept coming back to me was, why? Why did they do that? Because at the time of the war, uh, they were completely at peace with the Americans around them. Uh, they had adapted beautifully. They were prosperous cattlemen. They were raising cattle, you know. Uh, they had silver tea sets, for Pete's sake. Mm. <laughs> they, were, they, were more, they were more prosperous than the whites who were, who were living in the, in the area. They threatened no one. They were living on lands that the whites didn't want. Uh, why then? Why force them in? What's the reason? Uh, and the only reason I can think of was um, the Little Bighorn. You know, mm. This year before, this humiliating defeat at the hands of the uh, of the Lakotas and the Cheyennes. Uh, with that, 
the government said, uh, okay, that's it. Everybody, even our best friends, have to give up. And they have to come in into reservations where we will, we will control them. Yeah. They'll so, control them and then force Christianity on them as well. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen uh, Taylor Sheridan's uh, series, uh, 1923? It's a, a, pre, a prequel to Yellowstone. Have you ever watched any of those shows? No. no. Really good show. No. But one, one of the things that 1923 documents, it stars Harrison Ford, and it's, it's very interesting, but it, it documents these women that are forced from their tribe to go into these schools mm-hmm. where their uh, Christianity is forced sure, upon them. They're sure. beaten and treated horrifically. It's, it's very hard to watch because yeah, yeah. you know that that is what happened. Of course, yeah. That's the boarding schools. Yeah. That goes way back before 1923. By 23, it's sort of, it's sort of winding down. Um, but yeah, yeah, all sorts of, of course, uh, scandalous uh, news recently in the past year or two about the kinds of uh, treatment that came out of those, down those schools. Here in Canada, the same sort of thing is being revealed in, in in Canada about the abuses under those under those schools. Yeah, it's yeah. not just Christianity that's being forced on. They are uh, required uh, to speak only English. Mm-hmm. You know, they're punished if they speak their own languages. Yeah, uh, they're for, they give up their their appearance or cut their hair, uh, dress in a certain way. Uh, now, there's a wonderful irony in that show. <laughs> I said a moment ago, uh, most people, most of the public think of uh, you know, the Indian as if there's one group of people. <laughs> right. The, the Indian. Native peoples, of course, didn't think at all like that. Uh, they identified with tribal groups. They identified with a band within the tribal groups, uh, often at odds with each other, you know, been fighting each other like everybody fights everybody else uh, in, in history. Uh, right. So their identity was, you know, when you say, uh, what are you? They would say, well, I'm a Cheyenne. I'm a Comanche. You know, I'm a Tlingit. You know, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I belong to this guy's band. Uh, so the idea of, and of the Indian was uh, completely foreign to them uh, mm. until boarding schools. And all of a sudden, in boarding schools, all the kids, all the young people are taken, required to go to these schools. All of these different groups, uh, they're all living together. (laughs) They're all forced to surrender much of their own individual cultures, those dozens of different cultures that they were, uh, uh, they'd come from. Um, And suddenly, it begins to dawn on them uh, they're now all speaking the same language, right? They're all, <laughs> you know, we've got much more in common than we have differences mm. among us. So there's a way in which, um, you know, the, the supposed purpose of a boarding school was to destroy Indianness. Yeah, the famous uh, phrase coming from a uh, Colonel Pratt, who was the one who founded Carlisle, was uh, uh, kill the Indian to save the man, or destroy Indian identity in order to allow these people to survive in the modern world. Wow. But what the ruling schools did <laughs> was, in fact, create the Indian. They didn't kill the Indian. The Indian didn't exist before that. It created this sense of common identity, uh, this sense of, okay, we may be Comanche, we may be Cheyenne, we may be Lakota, maybe may be or whatever, but we're all, we all have this common problem that we're facing, these common difficulties. So we need to think in terms of the Indian, mm. to bond, to, to, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to bond together, just like on a smaller scale when these bands decide to, uh, to join and unite in order to fight the military. Now on this much larger continental scale, Indians from all over, native peoples from all over uh, the nation now begin to see that they are related, related in their circumstances, not by blood. So the Indian was created, not killed, in the boarding schools. That's fascinating. When they initially tried to move the natives to reservations, Mm -hmm. how did they, were they doing it because where the natives were, there was valuable resources? 
Were they doing it because geographically they could control them better in these regions? Like, what was the motivation initially? It was all of that, yeah. Uh, certainly they were, uh, especially when they're in particular you know, places that uh, are very rich in resources. The, the great examples, of course, were mining rushes. Uh, these people who were, again, hunter-gatherers uh, living in this someplace, in this remote mountain area up in California or Arizona or wherever, uh, suddenly, you know, they're overrun by these people coming in, overrun because they are uh, they are living on some of the richest places uh, in the nation. Uh, so you got to get rid of them, right? Uh, uh, but there's also the reason that this is a way to control them uh, and to, in the eyes of the government, to transform them, right? Put them on these reservations, and you can turn them into the kind of people that you want them to be. Yeah. Make them American, mm. uh, and that's what. So it was both of those things, both of those things together. Which is historic. Like when we look back at it now, it's like one of the most horrific aspects of it that we just try to eliminate them, and just integrate them into our culture. Right. That was always the uh, the formal government goal. Uh, it wasn't simply give them a place to live the way they live. It was no. No. Virtually no one was saying that. Jeez. Even the people who were, were called, uh, it's sort of a, a formal term, Friends of the Indians. They were an organi- organization called the Friends of the Indians. And they were, uh, honestly, in their own hearts, they thought that they were doing what was necessary for the best for these people. Uh, but this was a... Uh, they, they said the only way we can do that, the only way that these people can be saved, is to transform them into people like us, you know, to make them into our, uh, to integrate them into our our culture, uh, and that uh, that depended on really basic three three things. Uh, three, it was, uh, it, it was uh, they had to become farmers, because you know. From the beginning in this country, you know that's sort of the ideal life. That's how you that's how you begin your your integration into the American economy. Farm, you know, the Jeffersonian vision, you know, of uh, the ideal farmer. Um, they got to be Christian. They have to have this common uh, common religion um, and education. We've got to take their young people, and we've got to put them in schools where they will be not only learn the basics of the three R's and so forth, but they'll be culturally educated. Yeah, they will be culturally transformed. So these boarding schools uh, were meant to transform these people uh, into Americans. But they, yeah. So yeah. Uh, so we, you often hear the term genocide thrown around, uh, and there are times in American history when that was absolutely true, when there was an effort to simply eradicate. Indian peoples. Uh, but the whole reservation system was not meant for that. Sometimes it turned out that way, but the purpose of it was this c- control and transformation. That's what was supposed to happen. And then when that happened, once that was done, then they, the reservations would be done away with. Everybody would uh, uh, live in harmony. You know? Wow. It, it didn't happen, be, of course. but Of course. It had to be so confusing to them what the resources were that the white man wanted to. Because they're like, why do you want gold? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you can't eat it. You can't use it as a weapon. Yeah. So strange. It is. In a lot of ways it is. Uh, you know, gold, as you said, it's, it's virtually useless. It's, it's very soft, right? Yeah. So you can't make it into a, a, a What a strange act. thing to be the most valuable of all commodities. It's really shiny. <laughs> but, but how bizarre <laughs> that so but, many parts of the world that agreed upon well, that. That's right. It's just cross culturally across hundreds of years. They are the uh, Egyptians, you know. Yeah. Egyptians call gold uh, the breath of God, you know. The Aztec uh, consider it uh, God's scat. This is the excrement of the gods, you know, that came. <laughs> so strange. <laughs> so strange, yeah. Now, it's not true, I think, that uh, once – there's some really interesting works coming going on right now by uh, a historian named Benjamin Badley, uh, who is studying in the California. Uh, in, in the gold rush, there were Indians who said, oh, hmm, 
they're going to give me a bunch of stuff for this stuff. Of right? course. And it's so they went, to, they went to work, and there were, there were hundreds of Indians who were in the gold fields before the uh, 49ers came. Really? To, uh, yeah.